All right, girls, we're back. This is what week four, and we're going to talk about premenopause. That just is women that have like had like girls anywhere that have had their periods from 10 until 40, just your normal period, just normal everyday monthly cycles. That's this group that we're talking to and how it affects our training, how it affects us and how we can work with it through nutrition and all the other things that Dr. Carmen is going to talk about. And I just want to introduce you. So this is Dr. Carmen Jones. She's my business partner. Um, she's a naturopathic licensed naturopathic physician based out of the state of Oklahoma. Um, she has backgrounds in both conventional medicine and naturopathic medicine. So she's like this diamond in the rough. She's got both perspectives. So I'm going to let you have the floor, Carmen. All right. Perfect. So when we're talking about, um, our cycles, right? I, uh, I'm going to introduce it and then I'm going to show you the different components that changes throughout the month, right? So when we're talking about what we have um, known as our cycle, our menstrual cycle. Um, usually that's that 28 to 30 days. Um, and within that 28 to 30 days between our periods, our hormones are changing. They're changing in a cyclic way. Right. Um, and so the hormones from day one is usually when our period starts. So when we think of our periods, when our bleeding starts day one, and then for some women, it may last three days. It may last seven days. Um, rarely there with there's some folks that go 10 days, but usually that's not a regular occurrence. Um, and then from day one, then day 14 is what we consider ovulation, right? That's when our, um, we ovulate, we release that egg from our ovaries. And so there are certain hormones that have to change in order for that ovulation to occur. Then after ovulation, that second two weeks is our, what we call our luteal phase. Um, that's kind of leading up to our period. Okay, so I want to outline that first because um, we can use, as those hormones change, we can use those changes to help us with our workouts, to help us build strength, build muscle. Um, and some of those changes are worth taking note because during our cycles, it can increase our risk of injury as well. So, um, so let me... I am a visual learner, so I tell everybody I like to share pictures. <laughs> so let me share a picture of what I just kind of described. Hopefully, let's see, um, you guys can see this. Let me move some things off my screen so I can see it. Okay, so, um, there's a lot going on in this picture and there's several different graphs out there, but I chose this one because I wanted to show you the relationships. So at day one, right, this is when our menses starts or when our bleeding starts. So if you see each one of these colors, um, these areas underneath the colored graph represent different hormones. Okay. This, uh, let's see, we'll go um this one right here this light blue one so these are lh these spikes um one is lh and one is fsh and we don't hear a lot about lh and fsh to be honest lh stands for luteinizing hormone and uh this blip down here is fsh this stands for follicle stimulating hormone and you'll see this uh follow this blue area under this curve this associates with the follicular phase so what that means is that in our ovaries right we hear about like we're born so women are born with so many eggs right all those eggs live in our ovaries in follicles and as um month to month some of those follicles will um begin to grow. And then when they hit ovulation, that follicle releases that egg. Um, and then they either um, is excreted or goes through um, fertilization. Okay. So what is also, and so we don't really 
we don't hear about this a lot. When we go into sort of that med perimenopause or menopause state, that's when conventional docs will start testing LH and FSH, okay? But um, so those kind of cover these two underlying blips. Um, I wanted to get those out of the way because this graphic um, shows you that relationship, but it is kind of several colors stacked on top of each other. Okay, so our big player, estrogen, right? This is what we hear about all the time is our estrogen. Um, our estrogen, you can see it is um, starting to climb. It's this uh, turquoise teal hill. Um, and it is its highest at during ovulation, okay? Then it decreases. The liver helps it to decrease. Um, then you see another hill during, uh, right before our period starts, okay? And then it drops off, and then our period starts. So these are important to take note of. Most of the research in the field of exercise um, uh, medicine, if you will, in relations to hormones in our cycle is usually around estrogen, okay? And so it's a matter of whether we have too much estrogen or not enough estrogen. Um, and so since our estrogen changes throughout the cycle, this is the most important part. So the biggest thing that we see regularly is our risk of injury, okay? Um, and we see this when our estrogen levels are high, so usually around ovulation um, for folks, so that's two weeks after your period starts, approximately. Ovulation, um, it can be anywhere from day 12 to day 16, right? Um, uh, so if people are trying to get pregnant, usually they tell folks, you know, around ovulation that four or five days, um, that would be the time to start trying. But um, as this estrogen increases, estrogen is known for, well, we have estrogen receptors all over our body, okay? So when our estrogen is high, it attaches to cells all throughout our body, okay? Estrogen is usually also high if uh, women are pregnant. At the end of their pregnancy, the estrogen levels start to climb again. And the reason is our adaptive response is that the um, higher the estrogen, it affects the receptors on our ligaments. So we get a more ligament laxity, okay? So the adaptation is that the more estrogen at the end of pregnancy, it helps with um, labor and delivery because everything stretches out, right? Um, well, our pelvis stretches, our pelvic floor muscles stretch for baby to pass through. Well, um, when we're not pregnant, that still increased estrogen during this ovulation phase um, still acts on the receptors on our ligaments so we can get a little bit more ligament laxity. So the majority of women who have injuries is usually during this time, okay? Um, usually we see a little bit more uh, joint instability for some folks during this time of the month. So keeping that in mind can be really helpful to reduce injury, um, to reduce, yeah, uh, let's see, recovery time, if you will. And so by, by changing the types of exercising and different strength training that we do can be helpful to work with our body um, during this phase. So, <laughs> Cause we, I mean, you know what we do in CrossFit, right? Yes. Like, how do, how do we do, like, how do we take that and translate that? So that would look like more, um, low impact things, um, more like hamstring curls, less like weightlifting, less stress on your knees. Um, so you would just, yeah. Um, emphasize more muscle bodies and less stress on the joints. Okay. During that yeah four or five day window okay does that make sense yeah i mean good luck <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> well, <laughs> well then, um i knew that i would be challenged when you brought up this topic <laughs> i mean if you tell me like one day i'd be like all right that one day but like four or five days like that's a whole week yeah well <laughs> 
Um, so we have to we have to figure out what what works for us, right? Mm -hmm. what, yeah, what works for us. Um, so, but the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because you know when we uh, when they do research and we compare to um, our counterparts, right, to our men. Um, women are two to eight times more likely to have ACL ruptures than men are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they're, I think, let's see, the second statistic I had is that we are four times more likely um, to have um, uh, tendon ruptures in our shoulders, right? Our, um, as well as ACL tears, um, gleno, glenohumeral injuries in our shoulders and our hips. Um, and they're relating that to our hormone changes, right? Yeah. yeah. So men still have estrogen as well, right? They have testosterone, they have estrogen and progesterone as well. It's just that the men, their level of estrogen doesn't fluctuate as much as ours does, right? Yeah. Now, our bodies, whether it's men or women, um, our bodies, uh, if we have a, uh, a lot of fat cells, those adipose cells, those actually convert our testosterone to estrogen, okay? So our, for our male counterparts, if they have excess fat, um, then oftentimes they can have higher amounts of estrogen as well. So then those folks are usually the ones um, that may be increased risk to injury as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also usually when we see that excess of estrogen, um, that's where sometimes it increases our risk, our, our increases our PMS sy symptoms, um, especially if you see this black arrow here, mm -hmm. um, that if we don't have this decrease in estrogen, because this is usually done by our liver is our prominent organ that does this. If we don't have this decrease in estrogen, um, then again, that can increase our PMS symptoms. It can increase risk for cancers, um, can also, yeah, increase that risk for injury. So it sounds like just kind of planning like uh, during ovulation, like sort of like a deload week. You can still do all the things. You just deload and take, reduce the weight. And right. it has like a recovery week in the month. Yes. Yeah. That would be and good. I think that it's important to listen to your body because you know, when you're, you, you will be tired and exhausted. You know what I mean? Like, uh, there are weeks or days, you know, when I just like, I know I have to take it easy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So <laughs> the, so the other thing that I wanted to bring up was that, um, so we, we can work with our cycles, right. In this, in this manner. Um, the other thing is that, let's see, I wrote it down. Um, When we're talking about working with our cycles and our workout routines, okay, mm -hmm. uh, the science also tells us that. Um, okay, so if you let me go back, when you want to do your the hardest workouts, that would be sort of that pre-ovulation, post-ovulation, right? So yeah, if you did your recovery week during ovulation and listening to your body, um, but the other thing that uh, that the science tells us is that um, the higher our progesterone, the less muscle growth we have. Okay. 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 So in relation to the luteal phase, the second half of our uh, cycle, right? This estrogen is associated with this big pink hill. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see on the luteal side the second half after ovulation we have our estrogen is a little bit elevated um and our progesterone's at its highest okay okay so um it's a little bit harder for our uh, for us to um not uh build muscle <laughs> 
been a long day. My brain's just not quite there. Uh, to build muscle when our est when our progesterone is is higher. Okay. Now <laughs> I see that look. <laughs> Okay, so you got to put it in context, though, right? Um, uh, so if you're trying to work with your body and trying to work with your cycles, I'm not saying to reduce the um, intensity or to reduce the um, exercise that you would do to build muscle. I'm just telling you that those muscle fibers are not as receptive when um, progesterone is higher. Okay. Okay. The reason, so, and this is a little bit different as well, because the reason why the, that science came to light is because of women who take oral contraceptives. Mm -hmm. Okay. So women who take oral contraceptives, um, often their progesterone is high because those oral contraceptives kind of hijack this whole process so that instead of these hormones being cyclic in all these hills and valleys, instead, usually that progesterone is kind of high across the board and kind of tricks your body into thinking it's pregnant. Um, so you don't have as much muscle growth, right? Um, and so for women who are oral, on oral contraceptives, they may still have this regular cycle right? Um, but that higher level of progesterone, that lack of ovulation will change their ability to um, build muscle in efficient ways. Okay. Okay. So when is the optimal time then? Like, it's like almost like we've been taken out for two whole weeks of the month. No, 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 no. <laughs> So, so there's difference, right? Like, so when we're working out, there's different um, goals, right? Like you're increasing um, endurance, right? You're increasing stamina. Yes, you're building muscle. Um, you're trying to stabilize joints. And so it's just a matter of kind of manipulating those workouts to focus on different areas throughout the month. Which if you're in a regular gym, doable, but we're cross in CrossFit, we're subjected to whatever programming is going on. That's usually built by a man. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> but even if it was built by a woman, you know, she may be on a different cycle. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. This week I'm ovulating. I need a deload week, please. Could you program <laughs> that one? Yeah. And next week, my progesterone is going to be high. So I'm going to need to not work on strength that week. <laughs> Maybe they need a little influence and a little bit. <laughs> so it's really the week before the period, two weeks after ovulation is like your major window for like strength gains. Um, I, I, think, I think you said that incorrectly. So, cause, um, from the day your period starts to ovulation, that's the, technically the first two weeks, mm -hmm. that's this, um, air, this technically first two weeks, uh, that's a great time to do that strength training. Yeah. That, you know, building muscle, um, strength training. And then, uh, I, if you have a little bit of flexibility, right? I'm not saying that you should take these four days off during ovulation. Right. It's a matter of changing up the workouts to um, either not go 100% or be very wary, right, of your stance, how you're um, holding yourself. You might consider wearing brace a brace that day, right? Like if you feel like, hey, you know, um, I'm feeling, a, you know, check in with your body, right? If you're yeah. feeling a little bit of ligament laxity, if you've had an injury, um, you're more susceptible to re-injury during this time because your estrogen is a little bit higher. So you could use that week as a deload week, or you could use that week as a technique week. Yeah. Focus on the technique, do less weight. Yeah. Well, and I'm feeling this like right now, you know, because luteal stage for me is my PMS basically. And I know it because I have low energy, you know, like this whole week. And I'm trying to be gentle on myself, you know, like we're still in lockdown. We've been on lockdown down for like two and a half months now. So, you know, it's working out from home. Like our gym is locked. It's closed. 
so you know like i'm i'm not very motivated i'm just taking it easy i'm just moving you know it's about moving mm-hmm. it's doing what you can you know but i feel it you know like i don't i'm not like gung ho as normal you know like it's easy like imams you know like just do whatever you know yeah yeah so but my question is about testosterone because i know testosterone also plays a role in muscle growth as well yes right like i don't see it on that chart like you said that the higher progesterone so luteal stage that's when it's hardest to build muscle yeah right yes yes where does this because i feel like i I lack testosterone yeah so testosterone in women is not necessarily cyclical okay there is a relationship between estrogen and testosterone okay so our body actually has to take testosterone and make it into estrogen it actually metabolizes all our testosterone and turns it into estrogen so um when we see these um, higher levels of testosterone or of estrogen, these hills, um, what's actually happening is that our cells have this hormone called, or hormone enzyme called aromatase that actually um, ch- changes testosterone to estrogen. Okay. So we Does don't it have see- to do with fat cells, adipose tissue? Yes. It does have to do with adipose tissue. Exactly. Yeah. So the uh, more adipose tissue we have, the higher amounts of aromatase, that enzyme, which takes testosterone and uh, changes it to estrogen. Okay. So the, so the same thing, the opposite, the more muscle we have, the less fat cells, the less aromatase, then we will maintain our testosterone levels and we won't make an excess of estrogen. Do you follow me there? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm right. Okay. That was- <laughs> That's okay. So um, so our the reason why testosterone is not on this graph is because it's not as cyclical, right? Um, our testosterone is directly related to our muscle mass, okay? So the amount of muscle that we have is, is how much testosterone our body maintains. Um, if we don't have a lot of muscle mass, then our body takes that testosterone and it, it um, converts it to estrogen very quickly. Okay. And so, then we can have estrogen dominance, which yes. will lead to ligament laxity. <laughs> yes, yeah. Now I will tell you if you have, so estrogen dominance is often, uh, it's often a liver issue, um, but it can definitely be a conversion issue where your body with the increased adipose, your body's converting testosterone to estrogen too quickly. And then the other side is your estrogen is not metabolizing or breaking down in a, uh, in a timely manner. Okay. Um, but let's see. I was just going to say something. Oh, um, you can, you can influence your estrogen, uh, with exercise and with training, right? So the more that you exercise, you're actually, because you're building muscle, you're decreasing your estrogen at the same time, right? Cause you're building muscle, you're, um, supporting that testosterone, you're reducing your estrogen. So you can directly influence how much uh estrogen your body produces around ovulation and especially the second half during the luteal phase based on the amount that you train okay now we can always go a little bit overboard (laughs) because just like too much estrogen can be a problem not enough estrogen can also be a problem so if we overtrain um and we reduce our estrogen levels um below that 19%, uh, no, sorry, increase our estrogen. If we overtrain and we increase our muscle mass, decrease our uh, percentage of fat to less than 19% body fat, then we're not producing enough estrogen to have a period, right? So we have to also be cautious or wary of that because Sometimes we see that 
um, in uh, young people, right, in teenagers, but we also see this in um, bodybuilders. We see this in people who overtrain, um, that they may train to the point where they don't have enough body fat to actually produce that or convert that estrogen. Um, not so that I'm just, arguing with science, but I think it probably is a little bit lower in terms of body fat percentage. Like, cause I've been down to 13% and I was still having my period. Yeah. That's just an average, right? Um, so, uh, you usually, uh, yeah, it kind of depends on the person, right? But it also depends on your hormone makeup. So uh, if that, if you're at 13%, but you have very strong um, aromatase enzymes in those, in even that small amount of fat cells, um, then you can still be converting to estrogen. Okay. Yeah. And so, that's genetic? That's probably genetic that Kim has? Yeah, there's probably a genetic component there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I brought that up because even if you have a lower levels of estrogen, so um, that can also create symptoms as well. So we've seen, so I know we're not really talking about menopause here, but we may be talking about perimenopause. Um, the science also tells us when we have low estrogen levels, um, that it is also a little bit where um, estrogen is very protective. So when we have lower estrogen levels, um, we our body is not as efficient in metabolizing um, our food and um, building muscle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Are you still with me? Yes. Right. Exactly. Internet looks like it's being weird. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yes. So, so it's that kind of that happy medium, right? Uh, we don't want too much estrogen, but we don't want too little estrogen. Um, so um, they've compared uh, women who have lower levels of estrogen, usually because they're around perimenopause and menopause, um, to our male counterparts and have seen how efficient uh, we metabolize um, our foods and our hormones um, and build muscle. And there's a distinct difference between women who have low estrogen, um, women who are supplementing estrogen, and then um, those male counterparts. So, yeah. So when you say supplementing estrogen, do you mean like a synthetic estrogen or? Um, so in the experiments, they've done bioidentical estrogens, but it could be synthetic. Yeah. Um, but they're, do they're looking at like um, bioidentical hormone replacements is the, what, where the science lies. I've heard about it, but I don't know much about it. So what does that mean? Identical? Like, does it come, where does it come from? An animal? <laughs> um, so the synthetic one, so yes, it does come from an animal. Um, sometimes it comes from horses. Um, some bioidentical hormones will come from pregnant women. Um, that's the majority of the ones that are bioidentical that are compounded are usually um, from pregnant women. The synthetic ones are usually from horses, sometimes cows. Yeah. I, I, I don't get it. So pregnant women give their hormones? Um, like how so, you, so usually they collect it in their urine. Yeah. Usually they collect it in urine of pregnant women um, and they use those metabolites to create bioidentical hormones. Yeah. So those bioidentical hormones could be estrogen, progesterone, or testosterone. But the majority of the time it's... A pro or, estrogen and progesterone yeah oh wow so what if we're on like really low progesterone then like in at the beginning of this that would sound really good because that means i can build muscle because i don't have to worry about progesterone getting in the way yeah wait if you're on low doses of progesterone no, like how i am like I have low, oh, if you have low progesterone, it seems like it's an asset to me. Cause then I don't have to deal with progesterone blocking me from building muscle. True. Um, it's the relationship between the progesterone and the estrogen. 
So they are not one without the other, right? So it's that relationship. So if your progesterone is low, you want your estrogen to be low as well. If your progesterone is low and your estrogen's high, um, that's not as efficient in you building muscle. Yeah. Um, and strength and strengthening. Yeah. Okay. So like so, in the estrogen dominance, like my medical stuff. Yeah. Can you use me as an example of like what it's doing? Like I'm, I'm low progesterone and my liver is not filtering out estrogen well enough. So it's taking my testosterone and converting it into estrogen. Yeah. So how is that impacting my athletic performance? So, um, what that means is that it, you're, it's just really, you're not as efficient. Okay. So because that estrogen is, it's that progesterone is actually being masked by your higher levels of estrogen. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and those higher levels of estrogen, it is, it's so, um, I don't know that you've experienced ligament laxity or have noticed like, you know, some, um, unstable, like a little bit of instability in your joints. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we compensate for that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, as you build muscle, you strengthen, um, those joints because you're strengthening the muscle attachments, yeah. right? So you can kind of compensate for that. Um, but when you have the elevated levels of estrogen over time and they don't come down like this, um, a first blue hill here. Mm -hmm. Um, that's where your progesterone, you don't have this tall pink hill, if you will, <laughs> um, because it's being masked by the estrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what that means is that, um, you're more likely to have some symptoms, right? Higher amounts of estrogen. You often have, um, PMS symptoms, um, you can see the ligament laxity, but I think that, to be honest, I think that you're overcompensating because when you work out, you lower your estrogen levels. Mm -hmm. So if we're applying this to you um, and you're not experiencing a lot of the um, like estrogen dominant picture, things like fibrocystic breasts, migraines, endometriosis, right? Um, really intense cramping around your period um, is because your body's compensating somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. So you want that, like, even though this sounds like to a CrossFitter, like, terrible like great ovulation week i have to take it easy the next week i'm not able to build muscle but like we really do want to optimize this because that then optimizes our performance and our ability to gain muscle we don't yes. want one to be off from the other right yeah yeah um it's it's um i don't know that it's very uh i guess maybe realistic or or helpful for your body when you're working against it instead of with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the idea with just kind of understanding our cycle and how our period or how our hormones change throughout the month um, can help us get a better understanding of how to maximize your time in the gym with your time of the month. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. I also, let's, um, I was trying to make sure that I, uh, shared all the information that I, um, meant to, and I think so. Oh, okay. So, uh, let me go back when you were talking about estrogen dominant and you wanted to, to, um, understand that a little bit more. If your estrogen is higher and your progesterone looks low, right? Your progesterone is being overshadowed by that high amounts of estrogen. Um, that imbalance, it does, it's twofold, right? It makes it harder to build muscle to like to tone muscle and it makes it a little bit harder to burn fat. Um, yeah. So 
I mean, if you're pushing through and compensating in other ways, um, then yeah, you don't notice the symptoms as much, but um, really looking at optimizing our hormones and optimizing the cyclic changes, uh, this ratio between the estrogen and then the progesterone and how it changes throughout the cycle, um, I think is very beneficial in women to help to, um, you know, maximize uh, their strength training, right? Maximize um, everything that you're doing in the gym so that it creates a more efficient um, uh, uh, program. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know that, uh, you know, let's say like mood swings, uh, lack of energy, being tired, like it's examples, like you know that your hormones are out of whack, right? like some of the symptoms, right, of um, disbalance. Uh, like, is there like symptoms, certain symptoms, like you say, oh, I'm like estrogen dominant or like progesterone dominant that could indicate that you're one or the other? Um, so there are, you, I mean, you can definitely do that in, in, in testing. Um, but so the estrogen dominant is where you see those things like the migraines, the headaches around your period, um, you see more uh, a heavy, really heavy flow, heavy periods with a lot of clotting. You see um, those that intense cramping. Um, it sometimes takes your breath away or keeps people from going to work. Um, those endometriosis symptoms, that is usually an estrogen dominant picture. Acne, yeah. right? Acne, Acne yes. depression, anxiety, um, infertility. Yes. Yeah. Those would all be under estrogen dominant. Yeah. That is more common than progesterone dominant, dominant, to be honest. Um, that is much more common because usually progesterone dominant, um, we usually get that, uh, uh, synthetically through oral contraceptives. Yeah. Progesterone? Mm-hmm. Progesterone? Oh, but uh, like in luteal stage, it goes up, right? Progesterone? Yes, naturally. Yes, but naturally. it's not. That's not considered progesterone dominant. Oh, okay, okay. I see. Okay, yeah. okay. So a lot of teenagers, you know, like let's say they have like acne. I guess it means that their hormones are out of balance. So there's actually a lot of different causes to acne. <laughs> it's not just hormones. Um, that's a little bit of a myth, I think, that that's out there. Now, there can definitely be a hormone imbalance. And we know with teenagers, um, usually they're hitting puberty for uh, boys and girls. Um, and so we do know that their hormones are usually out of whack. But it can also be a lot with diet. It can be a lot with their underlying health. Um, because what are... And their the health of their digestive tract because the, the health of our digestive tract directly manifests on our skin. So mm -hmm. um, it can be multifactorial, but we do know, right, when um, people hit puberty, it's going to take a couple of months in order for the hormones to kind of balance out because all of a sudden, you know, um, these cells are starting to ex excrete hormones at higher levels than they had in the past. So... But I do think it's important to like talk about that. Like, cause Carmen and I did, was it a podcast episode? We talked so much. I can't remember. Probably. What. <laughs> um, that like after their first two to three cycles, like the hormones should start balancing out. So for me and my story, when I turned 13, I had my first period. Right. And like it, it didn't take those three cycles. Like I spent my entire teenage and twenties with estrogen dominance. So I always had acne. I always had all these things that just got allocated to like, oh, you're a teenager, you have acne. Yeah. And they were all red flags that I had estrogen dominance for my first period. Were you working out a lot when you were a teenager? Yeah, I mean, I've always been an athlete, right? Okay. I think this part, but, like in my story, I think Carmen, correct me if I'm wrong. It's because I had so much toxin overload as a kid and my liver was not able to keep up with 
filtering or like cycling through estrogen. So I was already backed up liver wise before I hit puberty. Right. Isn't that what we've decided? Yes. Yeah. 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 And, um, I was going to say as while we're talking about acne, because it's coming up more and more, um, is if, especially if in, in women, um, you had acne as a teenager and you were adult and you didn't have acne and now you, yeah, you're like, well, we're considering, you know, um, perimenopause, maybe like in the forties and it seems like you're getting acne again. Um, some that's is still hormone response, but sometimes that is our stress hormone cortisol and not necessarily our estrogen or testosterone. Yeah. But the story of acne is a symptom telling you something under, underneath has gone wrong. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it is a check, uh, check engine light. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's your body sending signals of like, Hey, I need a little attention here. Uh, we need to work on something. Yeah. Specific to help to clear out. Um, uh, usually it's the liver, but it can be the digestive digestion as well. Perfect. So to support um, our fluctuation in hormones, okay, to support your working out routine um, and your workouts, uh, there's a couple things I wanted to mention. One, um, foods high in sulfur and foods in the cruciferous family. So those are cabbage family foods, like cabbage, uh, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, kale, right? Our favorites. <laughs> Those are very high in sulfur. That is one of the main ingredients that our liver needs in what we call phase one to detoxify the body, right? So when we're talking about this ratio, this up and down, these hills and these valleys, of our hormones, um, our liver needs to be working well in order for that to occur. So we can support the liver by eating those cruciferous foods on a regular basis, um, especially during around ovulation, because that's where we see those valleys start to occur. Um, that can be very, very helpful um, in balancing out our hormones and making sure that our body's being even more efficient. Um, another part is fiber. Okay, so I don't know that um, we always talk about fiber enough, but I give people a goal um, of 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day. So the liver's part of the digestive tract, right? As it breaks down these hormones, um, it needs to eliminate them. It does a pretty good job of recycling them, but what needs to, what isn't recycled needs to be eliminated. So by increasing our fiber, we're supporting the gut health, uh, we're binding those excess hormones our body needs to get rid of uh, so that it can get rid of it through elimination. So mm -hmm. cabbage family foods and broccoli. Yay. <laughs> Jana's doing my uh, 30 day challenge. Oh yeah, and great. One of their things is they have to eat a cup of that family. Yes. Yes. The cabbage family. Good. <laughs> yeah. I just planted a bunch of kale last weekend. Well, a couple of weekends ago. Yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. You'll have plenty then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I eat very clean. I've been a vegetarian for like over 20 years. Okay. Well, I, like now I'm over pescatarian. So I do eat oh. eggs and fish, uh, but that's only in the last seven years or so. Okay yeah <laughs> perfect um the last thing i wanted to add is um just like we're supporting the liver in metabolizing and breaking down these hormones um we can also help to support the body in producing these hormones okay these are all um what we call steroid hormones so that means that they require a fatty acid backbone, okay? That's where those omega-3s are very, very helpful. Uh, we know omega-3 is often around like heart health and brain health, but it's also essential and part of our hormone health as well. So um, increasing 
omega threes uh, is can be is, yeah is essential in our hormones, but um, we can do that either through supplementation, through flax oil. We can do that through fish oil. Um, we can also increase our nuts and seeds uh, that increases the fatty acids to support appropriate levels of estrogen and a progesterone in that ratio. Um, so those are adding seed, seeds like chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, um, chia, pumpkin, sunflower and sesame seeds. Yeah. Um, to your diet on a regular basis. I tell folks aim for two tablespoons a day. Okay. To get those seeds in, um, they can be, um, whole or they can be ground. If you're doing, oh, I didn't say flax. If you're doing flax seeds, you want to ground, grind your flax seeds. Okay. Um, and you want to grind them just like one to three days at a time. You don't wanna buy it ground. Um, if you do, you're getting it for the fiber, which is great, right? We said the liver needs that fiber, but if you, uh, but you're not getting it for the omega-3s. So buy it whole, grind it yourself, just grind a couple of days at a time, store it in the fridge. Um, that'll get your omega-3s in and your fiber with the flax seeds. Yeah, but the chia seeds, the pumpkin seeds, those don't have to be ground. You can just eat those or sunflower seeds. They've got sun butter now that they've already ground it up for you. So, um, but increasing those uh, specific seeds are very high in omega-3s. They'll help with build the backbones to produce appropriate amounts of these hormones when it's, yeah, when it's needed. So. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Well, uh, like I know Kim did that profile, the hormone profile. Mm -hmm. Like I was just wondering, how did you do that? Through Dr. Carmen. Okay, but like, is it like urine or yes. blood? Yes, so it gets okay. into your house, a kit does. And if you ever get one, read like the entire directions, like the whole pamphlet. <laughs> Cause it's very specific, um, but you get the kit and it has a urine test and then it has a saliva test and you do the saliva test four times in a day and then you freeze it all and send it back to the company. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, we see the, when we're looking for hormones, when we're looking for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, um, and even our cortisol, uh, and our neurotransmitters, we find that in the, in urine samples, we can measure those metabolites, um, and how they change, uh, much more effectively than if you were to get serum labs, um, drawn. And so that's why I prefer doing the urine analysis for hormones. Um, it, it reveals more information to us than just uh, what's free, unbound, floating in your blood. Yeah. Very interesting. So Kim received her profile, but she doesn't need her uh, like a bio, bio identical hormones. She doesn't. Um, are we, we're doing progesterone is that's not bioidentical or is it? No. Um, so, uh, no progesterone is progesterone. The one that you're doing is the USP progesterone. Um, but it also has herbs in it that supports your body's production of progesterone, mm -hmm. um, to give it that little extra support so that your estrogen and progesterone are at the appropriate ratio. Yeah. So it doesn't, that estrogen doesn't overshadow while we're trying to clean up the estrogen. Yeah. It's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. All right. That's it. That's all I got. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Now I'm going to go and share my knowledge because I have a lot of <laughs> friends who are, you know, like I know that they have, they're probably perimenopausal. 
-hmm. so they they're always complaining about this and that and injuries like at our crossfit gym everybody has injuries you know yeah Yeah. yes next week we're actually talking about perimenopause and we're talking about menopause but i'm sure Mm -hmm. carmen will talk touch on perimenopause but next week's topic is menopause and athletes yeah okay Mm -hmm. that's great well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carmen. Thanks. Thank You're you, Dr. Carmen. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.